Let us pray. Lord our God, help us to give our minds to you in our worship, that we may listen to what you have to say to us and do your will. Help us to give our hearts to you in worship, that we may really want to do what you require of us. Help us to give our strength to you in our worship, so that through us, your will may be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended Lord. Amen.
Good morning and a very warm welcome to our service of um, Holy Communion with Spiritual Communion on this seventh Sunday after Easter. Lovely to join you all. You may notice the observant among you that I'm now in church. I am supported by Joe Kitson and it's really lovely to be here. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. What God hath prepared for those who love him, he hath revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything. Therefore, let us in penitence open our hearts to the Lord, who hath prepared good things for those who love him. Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like the morning cloud, 
like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us. Deliver us from judgment. Bind up our wounds and revive us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ has gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first lesson is taken from the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 15 and 17, and from 21 to the end. <clears throat> In those days, Peter stood up among the believers and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us throughout the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Basabas, who was also known as Justus and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them and the Lord fell on Matthias and he was added to the 11 apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle is taken from the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. But now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they have, may have my joy complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'm preaching today on making choices. I feel quite sorry for both St Matthias and the other candidate Barsabbas of whom we heard today. First of all for St Matthias because nothing is heard of him since he was chosen and he appears to have paled into obscurity. I know the former Archbishop of York John Sentinel was of the view that the church actually made the wrong choice and they should have chosen Mary Magdalene, that first apostle to the apostles, to take the place of the twelve. I also feel sorry for Barsabbas, 
because each of us knows that sinking feeling of not being the chosen one whether in those early days of being chosen for school netball or, ho or football matches or the job candidate who hears with a sinking heart those words it was an exceptionally strong field of candidates and i'm afraid dot 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 but i will return to St. Matthias at the end so i want to focus today on making choices because this is the strong underlying theme of our readings it's interesting that although the apostles cast lots to choose matthias the system much used by the jews in the past there's no reference to the either the apostles or the early church using this system after that i think the reason was that as they received the gift of the holy spirit at pentecost which we'll celebrate next sunday they were equipped through the grace of the spirit to discern and to choose and god offers us that gift of discerning his will through the guidance of the holy spirit too but we need to make the active decision to listen to and be guided by that spirit and that's why the choices we make are so important our starting point however is god's choice and not ours because everything arises from that god's choice to lead us out of the darkness of our sin through coming in love some of you may be familiar with the poet rs thomas's wonderful poem the coming which i think expresses this so well in it god the father shows the son our world it's portrayed as a dried up ruined death dying world whose inhabitants trapped through their own sin plaintively lift up their thin arms in supplication the son is filled with compassion when he sees the world and the poem ends with his just two word request to the father send me so we see that before all our human choices lays the choice of the father to reveal our world to the son the son's response of asking to come and the father saying yes and the holy spirit who we see for example in those wonderful icons by rublev binding all together in the love of the trinity and God, Jesus lives out that love through obedience to God in his life on earth. And throughout St. John's Gospel, the Apostle shows us that very natural link between love and obedience. Now, to grasp what this really means, we have to understand what obedience means. We can be inclined, particularly nowadays, to see obedience as rather a negative virtue, particularly for adults, and associate it with a tendency not to think and take responsibility for ourselves, but rather to carry out somebody else's orders in a servile and unthinking way. Yet nothing could be further from the truth of the relationship between God the Father and the Son, as St John describes it. For what he shows us instead is a dynamic, constantly growing, developing relationship in which Jesus daily brings the world with its sin and brokenness and pain before God his Father, and in turn listens and responds to the word of his father. And St. John also shows us that Jesus, every day of his life among us, consciously chose to live the life of perfect love, and by doing so, helped many to glimpse God's kingdom, which is God's love lived out in this way. Today, in the extract of the gospel we heard, the apostle leads us into the depths of Jesus' prayer to the Father, in which he tells the Father how he has now fulfilled the mission God sent him to do on earth of love and is looking ahead to its climax. And that climax is, of course, the cross, where the ultimate transforming power of love will be revealed in all its fullness. And Jesus then prays for his disciples. He entrusts them to God, praying that they won't fall into the hands of the evil one. It's highly significant that Jesus doesn't pray they'll be taken from the world, from all that's difficult and dangerous. But in fact, he's entrusting them with carrying out this mission of love to the world. And on this small, motley band of men and women, the whole message of what his life and ministry and sacrificial death are about depends. They are the seed core of the future, and everything is going to depend on the choices they make. And that's why Jesus prays that they will remain in unity, because if they're divided, this whole enterprise is going to fall. 
We see, for example, in the book of Acts, how right from the start in the early church, there were tensions. There were tensions, for example, whether Gentile Christians should be asked to follow the Jewish law. There was tensions between Paul and Barnabas over the young apostle John Mark. And yet at the end, the choices they make are for unity. Today, we, like those first disciples, are being invited by God to enter that life of love and service, which expresses the eternal love between the Father and the Son. In the first epistle to St. John, the apostle writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might have eternal life. And Jesus shows his disciples how to enter into that relationship in the words of the Lord's Prayer that he taught them. It was the greatest gift he could possibly have given them because he was sharing with them as his deepest friends that love he had with God his Father and he was inviting them to join that relationship as well. So let's just think for a moment about the implications of this. It's a prayer that expresses that deep relationship of love between the Father and the Son which outpours in love for us and Jesus is now inviting us to join them. That's why the Lord's Prayer is nothing, is never something we should, we should just recite, but something which we should enter into with awe. The early church, glimpsing the power of this prayer, only allowed those who wished to become Christians to say the Lord's Prayer after their baptism. And it's important that we too appreciate what it means to pray this prayer with our whole being. As we pray it, we enter into that profound relationship of love between the Father and the Son, which is eternal love. But for us to grow and deepen in that love, we have to make the conscious choice every day to ask God to help us to be attentive to what that love means, if we're to live it out in our lives and help others to experience it through our witness. This is our choice, our obedience, if you like, being willed being willing to be called and moulded by God to do this. And this, above all times in the year, is the time to do it. For we're praying especially in this season for God's kingdom to come, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus has shown us how he lived his life among us and his death, that we can glimpse and experience God's kingdom on earth, and we can help make it a reality in the lives of others. And therefore, we need to reflect deeply how God is calling us and us as a church here in Geneva to do it. What do we need to ask God to help us let go of in our lives? Those things that we know deep down are trapping us and yet diminishing us, and yet we find so hard to let go of. And we also need to discern what choices God be, may be asking us to make now to help his kingdom come. As Elizabeth Doolittle, those of you who know the musical My Fair Lady, will remember her words to her young man who sings to her of love. And she says to him, don't talk of love, show me. So what is God asking us to show the world now? Jesus made the enormous leap of faith in entrusting everything before his death to his disciples, praying the Father would protect them, that against the odds they would carry out the hope and vision of God's kingdom on earth and lay the foundations of his church in the future through the choices they would make. And one of the first choices they did make in those early days was to choose St. Matthias to take the place of Judas. He was chosen so that the number might be complete, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Judah, and they were to be the leaders who together would help the church make those vital first choices to lay the seeds for the future. And I promised to come back to St. Matthias, and so we will. Although we don't know anything about him after uh, he was chosen, I think he must have at least helped the apostles to carry out that mission. There's nothing to suggest that he hindered them. In fact, he must have helped them in that task. I also like to think that he was, as many great Christian souls are, their lives are unrecorded in human history, but nevertheless, like many people we know, sowed great seeds of faith which bore rich fruit in future generations and those who perhaps though are known to us are beloved in God's sight. 
So I will urge each one of us today in this profoundly rich time in the church's year between Ascension Day and Pentecost, as we wait for the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, to be attentive to God, to say the Lord's Prayer in a new and deeper way, starting today at our service when we say it together. Ask God to work through you today, drawing you deeper into his heart of love, and to show you and me how he is calling us to help his kingdom come on earth now. Amen. Let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Let us pray. God of life and love, whose son was victorious over sin and death, make us alive with his life, that the whole world may resound with your praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ascended Lord, it is you we see as Lord, not the governments, not big business, not the media, we pray that through the values and beliefs of faithful men and women, you will establish a culture of integrity, truthfulness and compassion in all of society's institutions. So may we declare with, the, with ever greater confidence that Jesus is Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ascended Lord, we see a world of beauty and a tragedy. We pray that your ways of peace and justice may increasingly sideline the ways of violence and, and um, I can't read that word. We pray especially for the situation in Israel and Palestine, that the killing and the fighting will stop. We pray too for Afghanistan, Myanmar, the Yemen, and other countries on our hearts throughout the world. Strengthen the work of the United Nations and all peace-seeking organizations and establish a common passion for justice and the gift of hope. We pray that the leaders of all countries will seek peace with justice for their people and for the world. For, as we see in Israel, there is no, no peace without justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ascended Lord, we know you are Lord of the church, but sometimes the evidence is lacking. We try to be the church in our own strength, with our own wisdom, and so end up trading prejudices for truth and manipulation for compassion. Gracious and Holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray that as we are your people in the world, protect us from the evil one, sanctify us in your truth, and inflame our hearts with love for you and for our neighbour, and may our choices reflect your choices. Transform your church through love, starting here, now, with us. And so we pray for our Archbishop, our bishops and the ministry team and those training to be leaders, 
that they may be filled with your love and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift into your healing light those we know who are sick and those caring for them. We pray for Nathan, for Christine Downing, Chakravati Raghavan, David Robinson, Jacob Meyer, Rosabel de Silva, Paul Bangassa, Walter Punya, Josie Martinez, Francois Deria, Marianne Wheatley, Sylvia Mawson, Anna Poratin, John Taylor, Judy Chianti, Valerie Slesser, Francis Boo, Remy Boo, Jenny Sirachev, George Thomas, Emmanuel Palmer, Lawrence Runsinger. We commend them and ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ascended Lord, as we look ahead at the coming week, we pray that in every part of our lives, at work, at play, in our relationships, with our money, our time and our temptations, you will be Lord. In silence now, we offer you this coming week and may the light and love of God illuminate the hearts of our souls. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we hear the words of Christ's peace for us. God has made us one in Christ. He has set his seal upon us, and as a pledge of what is to come, has given the Spirit to dwell in our hearts. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit.
Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen priest, and make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who is sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks that after he had ascended far above all heavens and was seated at the right hand of your majesty, he sent forth upon the universal church your holy and life-giving spirit that through his glorious power the joy of the everlasting gospel might go forth into the world. And therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the saviour of the world. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we and the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, will honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praise into one, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Let us now prepare ourselves to make our spiritual communion. We offer and present to you, Lord, our Heavenly Father, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. Grant that being present together in heart and mind at this holy communion, we may now be filled with your heavenly blessing through the redeeming grace of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, in outward signs of bread and wine, you have made known your presence among us. As we unite with one another from the places where we are, may your communion be fulfilled in us, now through the work of the life-giving Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son Jesus Christ has sent us out into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Mary in a minute for the notices, but there was just one I wanted to give you today. Well, first of all, a big thank you to all who've helped today, and especially to Joe here in church, without which none of this would have been possible. Um, just some rather bad news I want to share with you. Um, I, I had my first COVID injection in February in the UK, a Pfizer one, and came in full confidence and assurance that I would be able to have the second one here in Switzerland. Because, of course, in England, you can't have the second one until 12 weeks after you've had the first. So they couldn't give me the second one before I left. Unfortunately, the Swiss authorities here have said it's not possible. They can't give a single dose. And we have looked at all other options. So very regrettably, I'm having to go back to the UK probably this week. There's a shortage at the moment, but they are then doing vaccinations at quite short notice. So I'm going to then start my quarantining and as soon as a dose becomes available, I will have it and then come back as soon as I can. What this does mean, unfortunately, is that next Sunday, there won't be a nine o'clock service in church, but there will certainly be a united service altogether online for Pentecost Sunday, next Sunday. So don't be worried about that. And Alan Amos will be leading the BCP communion online on Thursday at 10 o'clock, so that will be available for us all then. So I'm really sorry about that, but I will be in touch online and back as soon as I possibly can. So I'm now going to hand over to Mary for the rest of the notices. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, those who've actually been in the church, um, perhaps you could, I don't think you could see online very well, will have noticed that it's um, looking quite sparkly all the brasses have been cleaned and much else has been polished. So thank you so much for those who came to clean and clear things away yesterday. Um, we've actually made quite a lot of space under the organ loft. This afternoon, the junior, junior choir will be practicing in the church from three o'clock. So if you're under 20, um, 20 or under, I think it is, do come along if you'd like to join that. Uh, and if you are already a member of the junior choir and are not able to be there, could you let Claire know? It really helps her. Um, but it's great fun. And if you haven't joined it yet, do join. And this evening, Armel will lead the informal service at six o'clock online. Um, I think for the um, all age service next week that we were hoping that some of you would produce um, some sort of drawing or something that um, uh, represented what you feel about Pentecost. And I think Daphne hopes to weave that into her sermon. I don't quite know what the deadline is, but I think probably- um, we She's be soon, Mary. Ideally tomorrow. And if you could do it today, you've got Sunday afternoon, that's a good time for doing Pentecost images. So I would say no time like the present. Get a cup of coffee after the service and do it. You could draw something. It'd be lovely, okay. <laughs> and the young adults group will be back in the church hall and online, so sort of hybrid, from this Wednesday evening, that's the 19th of May. Uh, they're starting at eight o'clock. So if you're interested in that, do contact Armel and anybody new again is very welcome. Please, please join up for the Pentecost quiz that Joe is arranging next Sunday evening, the 23rd. You'll be placed in a group with other people, so it shouldn't be too daunting, and I'm sure it will be fun. Um, there's no charge, but if you feel like making a donation, it will go towards the COVID effort in India. So really, really do, do join up. It's something we can do as a community. We'll also be inviting you on Trinity Sunday, which is our patronal festival, which is the following week, the 30th of May perhaps to get together with some of your neighbours from our church community or indeed others, but, um, and either online or inviting them round in a, in a safe way. And details of both these will be in the MailChimp 
but particularly as we now start to have, or, or once Stefan is back again, we will start to have uh, two services regularly, really trying to keep the community that we've built together over these last months. Uh, these are some of the ways that perhaps we can do that. And our spring fair will be on, on Saturday, the 5th of June. So again, contact Joe if you would like to help. And it's really for everybody and everyone can contribute in some way. Yesterday's cleaning, I've been quite kind when I say that the average age of those present was 65 and we were quite small in number. So our fellowship really does depend on everyone. One of the sad things about living in Geneva is that people are always leaving. And this time it's Heather Gilly who is going back to Canada later in the month or perhaps even next week, both to resume her job as a doctor and also for family reasons. We will miss you such a lot, Heather. And thank you for all you've contributed while you've been with us here in Geneva. And we very much hope to see you back again, but our prayers and our blessings go with you as you return home. And join us just sometimes in the evenings online. <laughs> I absolutely will. Thank you, Mary. This has been the most wonderful church to join and be part of. I'm very grateful. Well, the blessings are on our side. <laughs> and finally, we have uh, sort of three besties. Uh, today, it's Christian Okello. Um, I'm not sure whether he's with his parents in Geneva or perhaps online from Zurich, but wherever you are, we wish you a very happy birthday. And I understand that it was Mervyn Poulston's birthday yesterday and will be Yvette Milosevic's tomorrow. So very happy birthday to all of you. And have a good time. <laughs>